and thanks to the first uh, panelists for taking, taking their seats. Uh, my name is Andy Cutchins. I'm the director of the uh, Russian Eurasia program here at the Center for Strategic International Studies. And uh, first of all, allow me to apolog apologize for my tardiness today and being caught up in traffic and uh, causing us to lose, uh, start about 10 or 15 minutes late. I think we have a really interesting uh, program this morning. Um, the Russia Eurasia program at CSIS has uh, done a lot of work in this region uh, over the past few years, looking closely at the North Caucasus, the South Caucasus, looking at the interaction of the North, -South North Caucasus, the South Caucasus, and regional powers, uh, influential regional powers around it in a paradigm we called uh, the Big Caucasus. We've also uh, explored this uh, in some detail in a project uh, that looks at the nexus between Turkey, Russia, Iran relations. Uh, one thing we have not done, and thanks to the, uh, the visit of <coughs> the, uh, the Center for Strategic Studies in Azerbaijan in Washington this week, is have an opportunity to look at uh, closely the relationship between Iran and Azerbaijan itself. Uh, this is a bilateral relationship that has implications for domestic politics in both countries. It's a relationship that clearly has implications for uh, security and economic issues, political issues in the South Caucasus, uh, as well as in the greater Middle East, as well as on more global issues such as nuclear nonproliferation and more specifically the, uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear program. So, uh, with great pleasure, uh, I want to welcome and invite to the podium uh, the director for the Center for Strategic Stud Studies, uh, Farhad Mamadov, uh, who will make some introductory remarks to launch our conference, and then we'll move into the first panel. Dr. Mamadov. Thank you. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Azerbaijani delegation and the Center for Strategic Studies of Azerbaijan and to thank you for organizing conference on Iranian-Azerbaijani relations at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I would like to say, first of all, that I am speaking at the event as a schooler and the views expressed herein are my own and don't necessarily represent the views of the government of Azerbaijan. History is a very important factor in our region, just like the other regions of the East. The majority of disputes and disagreements have a historical background. Looking back, we can see, for example, that for nearly a thousand years, Iran or the geographical territory now known as Iran was ruled by Turkish dynasties. For instance, the Afghan city of Ghazni was recently declared a center of Islamic civilization by UNESCO, honoring the 12th century Ghaznavid dynasty, Turks by region, whose territory included present-day Iran. These and other Turkish dynasties are also the founders of the modern Azerbaijan ethnicity. When it comes to Iran, we can see that Iran began to be associated with the Persian element and Persian identity only after the Pahlavi dynasty came to power in the early 20th century. Today, according to various sources, Iran is home to 20 to 25 million people of ethnic Azerbaijani origin. Most of them consider Iran as their own country. The history of Azerbaijan indicates that after the Russia-Iranian war of 1828 and the signing of the Treaty of Turkmenchai, historical Azerbaijan was divided and a large part of it remained within Iran. As a consequence of the agreement, <coughs> Armenian immigrants from Iran and countries in the Near East arrived in northern present-day Azerbaijan. Let me add that I use the, that term in a geographical, not political tense. Thus, the beginning of the 19th century marked a turning point after which we can start talking about the emergence of Iranian-Azerbaijani relationship. Iran's attitude 
towards northern Azerbaijan as part of the Russian Empire was contingent on its attitude towards the southern part of Azerbaijan. In the early 20th century, the Azerbaijanis of the north and south had unprecedented contact. Azerbaijan's declaration of independence stated that immediate measures were to be taken to establish friendly relations with bordering nations. Contrary to the Azerbaijani government's attempt to establish normal diplomatic relations with neighboring countries, Iran soon demonstrated its anxiety concerning the creation of a state with name Azerbaijan. The Iranian side predicted that the Azerbaijan Republic would sooner or later have influence in South Azerbaijan. During the Paris Peace Conference at the beginning of 1919, Iran presented an official memorandum of light of these worries. After the Soviet occupation of Azerbaijan in 1920, the relations between Iran and Azerbaijan become, became the bilateral relationship between the Soviet Union and Iran. It might be useful to recall the Great Liberation Movement for the Rights of the Azerbaijanis, which started in southern Azerbaijan at the end of World War II in 1945 and received support in the north. Nevertheless, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, relations between Iran and Azerbaijan started to develop. In 1991-1993, nationalist sentiments in support of a Turkish-oriented national identity were afoot in Azerbaijan. This led some caution on Iran's behalf. During the stage of active hostilities in Nagorno-Karabakh, Iran's actions were limited to calls for a peaceful settlement. But the opinions of the Iranian government were angled toward weakening Azerbaijan's position. For example, the loss of the Azerbaijani town of Shusha in Nagorno-Karabakh occurred immediately after peace talks held in Iran, during which the occupying Armenian armed units were able to regroup. Thus, Iranian-Azerbaijani relations are characterized by ups and downs, occasional stabilization, and rising tensions. To illustrate this thesis, there are several dimensions of the relationship that can be reviewed. First of all, Iran's attitude to the contested legal status of the Caspian Sea and division of Caspian energy resources, Iran's vision of the Armenian-Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, and Iranian-Azerbaijan relations in the context of the regional and global geopolitics. On the issue of the legal status of the Caspian Sea and the division of its energy resources, Iran has never been a major player because no matter how many times we hear about the discovery of new superfields of hydrocarbons, no significant reserves of oil and gas have been found in the Iranian sector of the Caspian Sea. Yet, the exploration, production and transformation of Caspian energy resources were the subjects of several diplomatic notes sent by Iran in the middle 19th. To this day, Iran has not backed down from its position on the legal status of the Caspian Sea, which has delayed negotiations and means that this issue remains on the agenda of the littoral countries. In the 19th, Iran was one of the <coughs> Azerbaijan's top trade partners. But during the past decade, Iran has gradually lost this position. Whereas in 2007, the volume of trade between the two countries amounted to $540 million. In 2011, it was just $305 million. Azerbaijan's total turnover by the end of 2011 amounted to more than $36 billion of which Iran's share was only 0.8%. Further, in 2011, Iran was ranked just 19th among Azerbaijan's trade partners and in uh, 23rd in 2012. According to Iranian statistics, Azerbaijan is not among Iran's top 10 trading partners. 
Iran's position on the Armenian-Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is one of the most important factors of Iranian-Azerbaijan relations. As a result of the Armenian occupation of 20% of Azerbaijani territory and the et ethnic cleansing of Azerbaijanis resulting in a million Azerbaijanis becoming refugees and IDPs, Armenia's border with Azerbaijan and Turkey have been closed for about 20 years. There are two out of the four countries with which Armenia shares a border. Thus, Armenia's relations with Iran and Georgia are vital. This is well understood in Tehran, which shows significant interest in relations with Armenia. Although Iran has formally expressed support for the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, along with the Minsk Group co-chair countries, it's not taking effective steps to punish the aggressor. On the contrary, Iran and Armenia have dramatically increased their trade in recent years. Whereas in 2011, the volume of bilateral trade amounted to $335 million. Recent data shows it has reached more than $500 million. Both sides have declared their intention to increase this to $1 billion. Uh, As President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said, has said, Iran accounts for 20% of Armenian foreign trade. According to Armenian sources, there are 500 Iranian companies registered there, compared to only 200 in Azerbaijan. Iran is interested in good relations with Armenia for a number of reasons. This includes support for Armenia in accessing the Black Sea coast, as well as a desire to take advantage of the information and networking resources of the Armenian diaspora in France, the United States, and other countries. After all, every time the issue of an attack on Iran comes to the fore, the Armenian diaspora reminds their respective government that Iran is one of the Armenians' two sources of oxygen. In, the con in this context, it's quite symbolic that Iranian Foreign Minister Salehi attended the inauguration of President Sarkisyan last month. After signing of the so-called contract of the century and the launch of the pipeline infrastructure exporting oil to world markets, some groups in Iran have actively sought to prevent Azerbaijan from strengthening its regional position. The first stand of this strategy is increasing pressure on Azerbaijan's domestic policy. Many of you know that as a country with a Shia, Shiit majority Muslim population, Azerbaijan is of particular interest to Iran. History shows that religious affiliation is a priority for modern Iranian identity. In second place is civic, ide civic identity, which serves to suppress ethnic identity. The desire of certain circles in Iran to export this form of self-identification to Azerbaijan has failed. The totalitarian nature of Iran's religious and political leadership failed to attract a secular Azerbaijan. Our economic development and the overall crisis in Iran have made Iran's political and economic models an appealing to our citizens. The only channel of influence that can be exploited is religious affiliation. Every Shia, in addition to the Holy Quran, the teaching of Prophet Muhammad salam, and his successor Ali, should be guided by the instructions of the Mujtahid. The problem is that at present there are only 31 of them left and they are Persians almost all living in Iran. Informational resources are very huge uh, from Iran to Azerbaijan. For example, Sahar 2, uh, an Iranian television channel that broadcasts in Azerbaijani, along with numerous internet resources, calling on the population of Azerbaijan to abandon the secular lifestyle and to establish a regime similar to Iran's. The pressure on Azerbaijan should be seen in the context of the overall situation 
unfolding around Iran in the past 20 years. After the occupation of Iraq by the United States, Iran dramatically increased its activity around the borders in Lebanon, Syria, Pakistan, in Iran, Bahrain, and of course, the South Caucasus. The hike of oil prices resolved the question of financing active work in the <coughs> aforementioned regions and countries. For example, the media outlets affiliated with Iran have actively covered the Armenian-Turkish normalization and the US support for this, support for this process that did some damage to the public image of the United States in Azerbaijan. As a result, this poorly sought out normalization of relations between Armenia and Turkey helped Iran by strengthening its position in Armenia and in Azerbaijan. Despite all of these factors, the Republic of Azerbaijan attached special importance to its relations with Iran because equal and mutually beneficial relations with neighbors are a priority of our foreign policy. Certain circles in Iran see the secularism, economic and especially cultural development of Azerbaijan as a threat to the current religious and political system of the Islamic Republic. Another group perceives Azerbaijan as a threat following the provocation regarding the use of Azerbaijani territory for launching a strike against Iran. But none of these statements can be substantiated. Our president has repeatedly stated that Azerbaijani territory cannot be used against the neighbors. Azerbaijan upholds this principle for many reasons, but one of the arguments is purely pragmatic. We don't want to see the economic situation deteriorate in country that is home of millions of our brothers and sisters. Our government has repeatedly stated that it will not interfere in the internal affairs of Iran in the context of infringement of the rights of the local population. We will not tolerate any interference in our own, own <coughs> internal affairs either. Having said that, we don't understand Iran's positively and lack of funding for the implementation of NAR source transportation projects, on the other hand, and the one side's focus and then financing of energy and transport projects in Armenia on the other. It's quite clear that projects in Armenia are not financially viable and will not bring much benefit. To conclude, I would like to state that Iranian-Azerbaijan relations can be described as relations of neighbors, but there is no pragmatism from Iran. A change in the relationship may be anticipated in the short term in context of Iran's democratization, when the opinion of Iran's Azeri population will have more impact and will be appropriate, uh, <coughs> proportion, pro sorry, proportionate in terms of political participation. Only this component can qualitatively change Iranian policy towards Azerbaijan and the South Caucasus as a whole, making it more stable under the banner of good neighborliness, mutual beneficial cooperation, and protection of the norms and principles of international law. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mameda, for uh, a very comprehensive uh, keynote address, raising uh, virtually the uh, full panorama of issues that we'll be continuing to discuss as the morning goes along. Yes, that's fine. Um, so we're going to turn now to our uh, our first panelists, and uh, we will go uh, in the order as how they were listed in the uh, the program. And uh, so uh, let me uh, welcome uh, and uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Asim Malazadeh from the uh, Parliament of Azerbaijan. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, we appreciate that uh, CSIS organized this event because the uh, situation in a region, it's a big region of uh, Middle East, uh, Caucasus, Central Asia, dramatically changing after the events uh, in Syria. And 
Uh, right now, uh, in uh, we, uh, I would like to start from history, because uh, Azerbaijan is a small country in uh, South Caucasus, and historically, South Caucasus, all this region was a region of great games. Big empires like Russian Empire, Ottoman Empire, Persian Empire, always fighting, and uh, small nations and this region always suffered of this uh, zero-sum games of uh, great empire, uh, British empire. If we look to the history in this region, we'll find a very interesting thing that uh, Iran and Azerbaijan always was uh, something like starting point of uh, a very interesting event. For example, uh, we think that one of the issues why uh, uh, Cold War started so fast uh, was the issue of Azerbaijan. In 1944, uh, there were uh, Azerbaijani uh, Republic of South Azerbaijan, and uh, you know that in 1941, Soviet Union and uh, UK uh, divided Iran because Iran had uh, flirting with uh, fascist Germany. And as a result of that, uh, northern part of Azerbaijan, uh, third time in the history, they were created the Republic of Azerbaijan. But uh, uh, an interesting fact that uh, during the meeting in Crimea, uh, Winston Churchill and uh, Joseph Stalin agreed to switch uh, Azerbaijan and Poland. It's a dramatic situation on the history of Polish people and Azerbaijani people as a result of uh, transferring Poland to Soviet Union. A lot of Polish people were massacred, and you know the fate of uh, uh, Armia uh, Ludowa in Poland after the occupation, the dramatic uh, tragedy of Polish people. But uh, there is a lack of information what kind of tragedy happened uh, in Tabriz. Thousands of Azerbaijani people were massacred. Uh, they were massacred also. It was uh, something like joint operation of uh, Persia and uh, Stalin regime because some of people who escaped to Soviet Union also were killed there. And uh, maybe it's an uh, interesting point that uh, Poland and Azerbaijan had uh, an historic links. Maybe it sounds uh, paradoxical here, but uh, in Russian Empire, uh, where Poland was a part of that independence movement based in Baku, Azerbaijan. When Bolshevik army occupied Azerbaijan, Baku, Azerbaijani government moved to Poland and uh, continued its struggle for independence in Poland. It's an interesting situation that during the struggle of Azerbaijani people of independence, the role of solidarity and Polish movement and struggle for, uh, against communism was linked to Azerbaijan. Uh, very interesting uh, links because uh, Azerbaijan from the beginning of uh, 20th century became a world oil center. At the same time, Azerbaijan, in very turbulent uh, area, has been created first secular, multi-party parliamentary government in a Muslim Turkish world. It's a very important value for Azerbaijan, and when our country again achieved independence in 1991, Azerbaijan restored all the same principle, same flag, same symbolism, and same secular state in Muslim world. It became something like a tragic event for uh, Iranian Islamist regime. Independent Azerbaijan with the presence of uh, uh, Western companies with uh, open goal, because in all documents of Azerbaijan Republic, strategy of its development, it's a Euro-Atlantic integration. And uh, sometimes people asking uh, why Iran, uh, why Islamic Republic of Iran is a military ally of Armenia and uh, against Azerbaijan, because uh, existence of Azerbaijan, country with the name of Azerbaijan, is a serious threat for them. Uh, Iran think that they are even calling us, not Azerbaijan, but Iran. You are Iran, you are not Azerbaijan. And it's uh, maybe something uh, which is uh, based on uh, ideology, because uh, when people 
from Iran coming to Baku. Uh, it's something like people from former Soviet Union uh, visiting Paris. Uh, and uh, it's a serious ideological threat for them. And uh, of course, uh, during the uh, last uh, year, Iran uh, gave a serious uh, support to Armenia in the military uh, action against Azerbaijan. And we are looking to the situation when there is a triangle. Uh, Russia, uh, with the ambition of some forces restore Soviet Union. Iran, which uh, afraid of existing uh, pro-Western Muslim populated country. And Armenia, which uh, really is uh, bad for us, uh, which lost an independence. Uh, because uh, in South Caucasus, we need the serious cooperation of all uh, countries which are uh, there. Uh, right now, there is a serious uh, partnership between Azerbaijan and Georgia, which uh, choose a way of Euro-Atlantic integration. Armenia, which uh, became a military base of Russian Federation, and uh, Russia uh, privatized uh, all industry, transport, uh, uh, energy of Armenia, did not invest anything, but uh, there is a huge troop which is a major factor of the domestic political life of Armenia. And in the same situation, after events in Syria, uh, Russia and uh, Iran uh, started a serious uh, activity. Just uh, one factor, there is not a there are uh, bilateral links uh, between uh, Caspian countries like uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Russia agreed about the division of uh, Caspian Sea. Iran is opposing. And uh, at the same time, there is not a multi-party uh, treaty about that. Uh, in, in 1921, between Soviet Union and Iran, there were a specific agreement and treaty that Iran has no right for military navy on Caspian Sea. Uh, after independence of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, uh, other countries, the collapse of Soviet Union, Russia unilaterally allowed them to have a navy on Caspian. It's an interesting situation that, uh, for example, uh, ships from Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, has no access to, to Russian port Turk in Astrakhan. Azerbaijan also. We have no access to Volga River. Iran has. Uh, it means that the uh, Caspian Sea also became an area of uh, cooperation between Russia and uh, Iran. And in this situation, uh, new countries, new independent countries uh, of uh, uh, like uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan are uh, seriously suffering of uh, this uh, game. What Iran is doing? Uh, trying to export uh, Islamic revolution, they spend a lot of money. According to some Iranian sources, a period from 92 to uh, 2000, Iran uh, allocated in their budget about 48 million for Islamic groups uh, in Georgia and Azerbaijan. Because uh, also in Georgia, it's about a half a million of population, Muslim population, and Iran also trying to use this factor against Georgia as well, not only uh, Azerbaijan. They failed to do that because uh, strong secular uh, traditions in Azerbaijan not allow them to use this uh, Islamic factor. But uh, they uh, change uh, track and uh, trying to use a conflict which is existing between Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, with the goal of create a pressure. Uh, I, two years ago, I was in Yerevan and I was in Karabakh. And it was uh, strange for me to listen uh, in Yerevan Azerbaijani language. A lot of people spoke of Azerbaijani, and uh, they were Iranians. Even a mask uh, in uh, Yerevan under control of Iran. And uh, a lot of uh, support coming uh, to Armenia, military support, it's uh, economic support, uh, came from uh, Iran. Uh, there is another factor which uh, recently uh, changing the situation. It's a relationship between Azerbaijan, United States, and NATO country. Azerbaijan provides a great logistic to NATO operation in Afghanistan, and at the same time, relationship between Azerbaijan and Israel. 
From the first day of our independence, uh, we have a big Jewish community in Azerbaijan, and it's uh, uh, a very important part of our culture and history. And there is an Azerbaijani diaspora in Israel. The relationship between Israel and Azerbaijan became a serious factor. Just uh, economic uh, uh, figures. Uh, trade between Azerbaijan and Iran is about uh, something like uh, 300 uh, million. But but uh, trade uh, between Azerbaijan and Israel, more than uh, four and a half billion. It's uh, two times bigger than uh, trade uh, between Azerbaijan and Russia. Uh, of course, uh, this situation created a new factors. And after events in Syria, Iran provides very bold and aggressive politics in our region. Uh, why are we speaking and trying to pick attention on American uh, uh, public attention to this issue because Azerbaijan and Georgia are strategic partners of the United States. Right now, there are events in the region, very turbulent events, and it's uh, damaging national security interests of our people and uh, national security interests of the United States. Iran is the country which is supporting uh, totalitarian country, which is supporting uh, international terror in our region. Uh, for example, member of Azerbaijani parliament was killed by Hezbollah uh, mid of 90s. Now Azerbaijan playing uh, together with its partners, Georgia, very important role for European energy security. Uh, we're breaking a monopoly of uh, Russia for gas uh, to Europe, and uh, of course it's creating a new factors. Uh, situation now in our region as it was on mid of 90s when Azerbaijan signed a huge oil uh, gas contract with uh, international consortium with the support of the United States. Now Azerbaijan together with Turkey building a new pipeline system which uh, uh, giving a new hope for energy security of Europe and situation became very difficult. Uh, the uh, situation became difficult because of danger of Iran, danger of Iran for all interests of Western country and its partners. That's why, uh, the, thank you for your attention, and uh, I think that uh, we need a serious effort uh, of all our partners uh, to the security situation in our region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Malazadeh. Um, just a, uh, one note, uh, since we started a little bit late, we're going to continue this first panel until uh, 10.30. And another housekeeping note, uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Lu Zhang, our uh, visiting fellow from uh, China uh, here at CSS right now, is unable to attend this morning because he has fallen ill over the weekend. So we'll have a, uh, uh, a shorter panel uh, <coughs> in the, uh, the second panel looking at uh, regional and international implications of this relationship. Okay, let me turn now to uh, uh, Dr. Gaidar Mirza, a leading research fellow at, uh, this, at uh, the SAM Center in Azerbaijan. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank also Mr. Mamadov because coincidentally he mentioned the issue of mujtahids that I'm going to touch a bit detailed way, and uh, Mr. Molazada for the mentioning of the Polish factor in the story in the 40s. Probably that's where the Polish sympathies to Azerbaijan come from, because we always feel that support from the Polish people nowadays. Um, there are different things in, in, in the uh, relations of Azerbaijan with Iran, uh, which basically, uh, when analysts comment them, they, they, they talk about the current geopolitical context. But I think that uh, in Azerbaijan, many analysts uh, write about uh, the histor historic prerequisites and the importance of reasons which stem from the uh, history of the nation-building process of Azerbaijanis. However, in the West, uh, not too many people know about that and not too many people write about that. That's what I, what I want to talk about today. Um, Mr. Mamadov has touched a bit about the history. I want to go uh, in a little bit more detail. By the middle of the 18th century, when the Safavid rule in Iran ended and the country entered period of the long turmoil, more than 20 canids, uh, semi-independent uh, states, uh, existed uh, in the territory of modern Azerbaijan. And they were in the both sides of the Arax River. Predominantly, they were Shiite, and their leaders, the Khans, they were also Shiites, and they, almost all of them, 
uh, had roots from the Kızılbaşı tribes, the Turkic Shiite Kızılbaşı tribes, which were in future the core of the uh, Azerbaijani nation building. These canids were vassals of the Persian throne, however, they didn't recognize that uh, vassality. And uh, they, 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 the thing was that they always had to maneuver among Russia, Iran, and the Ottomans. And uh, although that was the period when Azerbaijani language has distinguished from other Turkic languages of the region, that, that was the very important moment in the nation building process, the subdivision brought to national tragedy because in 1828, Russia and Iran signed the Turkmenchai peace under which the territories went to the Russian crown and the territories south from the Arax River are still under Iran. And since that moment, the roadmaps of the two parts of the Azeri nation, they're developing in different ways. In the early 19th century, Azerbaijani Turks demonstrated low level of ethnic, ethnic consciousness. That was a period when uh, it was very specific for the unprecedented, right, uh, unprecedented rise of national thought um, in literature. At the same time, religious and religious identity took primary place in the minds of people. Religion here was the fundament of identity. It was blocking other forms of self-identification, first of all, the ethnic self-identification. Uh, before going on, I would like to say that I'm a Muslim, I'm a practicing Muslim, and I'm a proud of it, but I'm also an analyst and scholar. And what we're talking about is the, about the importance of the religious, the religious thinking and secularity in, uh, in the context of relations with Islam. The problem was that only in religion one could find support for his identity and uniqueness. And if in European Renaissance they were brought, they brought to victory of secularism over clergy and gave huge impetus to the evolution of various forms of self-identification, like for example ethnic self-identification or civil self-identification, but in the Muslim world Islamic dogmatism and religious um, obscurantism dominated for much longer. Clergy was the major obstacle in Azerbaijan for evolution of ethnic self-identification. However, Russian colonization brought to Azerbaijan European science and education, culture and values, ideas of enlightenment in the times when Islamic dogmatism was literally running through all the spheres of life. And under this influence, first Azerbaijani modernizers, nowadays known as the uh, classicists of national literature, they fully understood that first the cultural and social stagnation is con conditioned primarily by religious self-identification. And the birth of Azerbaijani national thought in literature carried obvious anti-clerical character. That's a very important point. And uh, it was built on harsh criticism of religious obscurant uh, clergy. In other words, to become Azerbaijanis, people had to grow over Islam and to realize that there was something more than just Muslims of the Caucasus or Muslim Turks of the Caucasus. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, at the national building process for Azerbaijanis, it carried a very specific and very obvious secular character. It's not surprising then when Russian Empire collapsed in 1917, in 1918, the first secular republic, democratic parliamentary republic uh, in the Turkic world, in the Muslim world was established in Azerbaijan. It was a secular parliamentary republic, and uh, it has a three uh, dogmas to, uh, on which it was built, and it, uh, it was the Turkic freedom, Islamic culture, and modernity. And these three things are described, uh, are, they, they are symbolized in Azerbaijani tricolor even nowadays. Um, in Soviet Azerbaijan, secular values uh, were even strengthened due to obvious dogmatism of the Marxist, Marxist ideology and its atheistic nature. So when in 1991, Azerbaijan is again choose secular option uh, for its uh, model of state, uh, despite secular way of thinking, speaking, and doing business of politics, they anyway stayed Muslims. And uh, recent limited access research conducted by the Center for Strategic Studies under the president of Azerbaijan shows considerable changes which took place in the society. Islam has become a considerable factor in the Azerbaijani society. Nevertheless, Islam in Azerbaijan is still more a way of a cultural identification rather than political philosophy. And the nation is still very much aware, unaware of Islam's place and role in modern politics. By the way, this is not a problem of Azerbaijan. 
uh, absence of awareness of Islam's role and place in politics is intrinsic to many Muslim states. And uh, even you, if you take Turkey, it took tens of years to find that appropriate model for that. So due to com complexity of historic factors described above, at the moment the features, which would be very positive for the Azerbaijani nation building in the 19th century, they're the weaknesses for Azerbaijan now, and the result is that the major problems are the low level of religious awareness among the wide variety of people and the absence of local theology school. That's the major problem. Uh, Azerbaijan is not able to produce their own mujtahids. Um, like these are the people that Mr. Mamadov mentioned in, their, in his speech, and I, I want to go a bit more in that detail later. As we're coming to the core point of my speech, I would like to stress that these two weaknesses uh, exist in Azerbaijan neighboring to Iran. Iran, which is demographically, economically, and militarily much stronger than Azerbaijan. Iran, which is a 4,000-year-old culture, but strong, structured, popular, and tested ideology, attractive to many people from Beirut to Kabul, and with numerous tools to propagate that ideology outside, including soft or not quite soft power. Iran, which considers territories between the Arax River and the North Caucasus as a part of its historic territory. And uh, as it has already been mentioned, not uh, some people in Tehran, usually the most aggressive ones, they don't even call Azerbaijan Azerbaijan Republic, they prefer to say Baku Republic, or a part of Iran, as Mr. Malazada oh, said. Iran. Yeah. Iran, their supreme leader, calls himself Amir al-Mu'minin, it means the leader of all Muslims of the world. This is an important positioning. And the foreign policy uh, concept of uh, Iran says that no problem from Lebanon to Kabul, from Derbent to the Gulf, can be solved without Iranian participation. And of course, this concept includes also the Karabakh problem. They think that the Karabakh problem cannot be solved without Iranian participation. Iran has been continuously supporting Armenian aggressors, at least in economic and infrastructural terms. Since 95, Iran has built three electricity lines connecting the two countries. A 1.2 billion cubic meters gas pipeline exists, and the gas electricity exchange plays an important role in cooperation of the two countries. Since 2007, Armenian cargo companies have border control preferences and easy procedure access to Iranian ports in the Gulf. In November 2012, 322 million US dollar Mehri Garachilar hydroelectric station project was initiated and that both presidents, Ahmadinejad and Sarkisian, participated in this ceremony. They're also discussing about the possibility to open the free economic zones and other forms of uh, cooperation. I'd also like to remind, as, as far as we're in the United States, I'd like to remind uh, a case about the letter, uh, letter from the former U.S. Deputy uh, Secretary of State, Mr. John Negroponte, to the President Sarkisian in 2008 regarding Armenia's transfer of machine guns and rockets to Iran in 2003. Those weapons were later found to have been used, at least in one instance, in attack in Iraq by the Shiite militants that killed uh, one U.S. Uh, soldier and wounded six others. So the, this, is, this is the weapons that killed citizens of the United States. At the same time, Sarkisian uh, was not present. He was the defense uh, minister. I would also want to, uh, like to mention, before we go on with the uh, Azerbaijan-Iran issue, um, I'd like to mention that uh, if you analyze Armenian media in English or uh, Armenian sources in English, you cannot find too many things about Armenian-Iran cooperation because this is a, this is a thought over thing. Uh, they tend not to speak about their cooperation with Iran uh, in English. Uh, you have to analyze the Armenian sources in Russian where they call themselves almost, bro almost brothers in arms with Iran. Because that's why if uh, Armenian analysts, English-speaking analysts, will talk negatively about Iran, you should open out and show them the things that are written in Russian and state information agencies of Armenia in Russian. So see what they answer if they can. So we'll go back to the issue. It's obvious that the um, level of uh, religious awareness and absence of national theology school, as I mentioned, were the problems. And these problems demonstrate at the moment considerable dangerous negative synergies with Iran's strengths 
Uh, let's bring a small example to describe just one tool that Tehran is using against Azerbaijan. And that's the thing that Mr. Mamadov mentioned, the power of mujtahids. Uh, we currently observe that Tehran, uh, it's the conservative part of its clergy, they are trying to politicize Islam in Azerbaijan and Islamize political agenda. So it means that um, there is such a mechanism as uh, Shiite Taglid. Um, it has been used uh, in Iran since 1979 to project its soft, not always soft power, um, not only in Azerbaijan, in Iraq, in the Gulf, uh, in Lebanon, for example. According to what, so what is Taglid? According to the rules of Shiite Islam, each Muslim, individual Muslim, or Mughalid, has to follow a scholar, or Mujtahid. And that scholar must be alive. One cannot follow a dead mujtahid. And that scholar must possess a right to issue fatwas, religious orders, prescriptions for Muslims. Um, majority of mujtahids are from Gum. This is the center of Shiite thought. And the power of Taglid, it doesn't recognize borders, state borders. It means that if a, if a mujtahid in Iran issues a fatwa that you have to go and overthrow your government, you have to go and bless the parliament, you have to go and keep pe people in the underground station, so literally the man has to do it if he's a true Shiite Muslim. And I want to mention also that uh, this also reminds me, as far as I'm a specialist on Russia, I think that this, is, this reminds much uh, the policy of Comintern in 90s, 20s, 40s, when the communist movements were the sort of a fifth column of various European states used by Stalin's intelligence. Isn't it like that? Um, three, three ayatollahs are particularly active in this, uh, in this field. Thank you. I'm finishing. Uh, it's uh, Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi, Ayatollah Nuri Hamadani, and uh, Ayatollah Jafar Supani, who from time to time issued fatwas of uh, an aggressive character. And uh, the last one worries me much because Ayatollah Jafar Supani has some followers in Azerbaijan and a number of his books are sold in the religious bookstores. So you should add up to this the number of NGOs, websites, and um, mosque jamaats. So these are the semi-proxies of Iran among Azerbaijani community. And of course, they, 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 they benefit from the situation that uh, there are some democratic values in our country, and it's not that easy to go and close an NGO or just destroy this or another Jamaat in a mosque, because uh, it's not like that. Um, so as I said, these dangerous synergies, um, uh, they, create the, they, can, they create advantage advantage for the conservative part of the Iranian clergy, which considers uh, Azerbaijan as a subject, uh, not object of uh, its interest. And it's very difficult to predict the exact development of uh, relations, because Baku has showed uh, considerable ability to, to, be, to be neutral against any provocations from Tehran. But at the same time, we have shown considerable ability to counter pressure when necessary. As for Iran, I think that it's not that bad, because it's a big country. And we cannot say that Iranian government is like this. There are different camps in that government, and there are people that have more moderate views towards Azerbaijan and its policies. And uh, we also understand that the elections are upcoming. So uh, we hope that uh, taking into account the, the balanced policy of Azerbaijan towards Iran and understanding of the importance of regional, global, uh, factors, uh, we will not see any harsh and uh, unpredictable developments in the bilateral relations. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Dr. Mirza, for uh, <coughs> uh, Excuse more. Excuse me, uh, one more thing. I, I'm not a doctor so far, but I hope I will be soon. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't have the power to. Uh, uh, confirm you with, with that. So uh, <laughs> let me uh, correct myself, Mr. Mirza. But uh, uh, it was a very interesting, uh, ex more historical exploration of uh, the, the challenges of nation building uh, in Azerbaijan and particularly the, uh, the religious re relationship aspects, be aspects of the religious re relationship between Azerbaijan and Iran uh, today. Uh, uh, last on our panel, and very much not, not least, uh, let me turn to uh, Alex Vatanka, uh, who 
is here in town in Washington at the, uh, the Middle East Institute and a renowned uh, scholar and analyst of um, <coughs> Caucasus and Transcaspian uh, Islamic uh, and Security Affairs. Thanks for joining us today, Alex. Thank you very much, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me start off by apologizing. I hope my voice will stay with me for the next five, ten minutes, but I picked up something on a flight coming in last week, so bear with me. Um, I, I really have two points that I want to go through. Uh, this morning. Point number one is, if you look at the last few months of developments in Iran-Azerbaijan relations, you've seen ups and downs. If you la take the last week, you see lots of new Iranian promises about security cooperation with Baku, why it's important and so forth. If you look at the week prior to that, then it was about Iran taking Azerbaijan to the international court, picking up a fuss over the division of the Caspian, threatening Baku with legal action, for allegedly polluting the Caspian Sea and so forth. So you see this pattern back and forth, c continuously going back, I would say, the last two years. And I suspect this will continue. And I suspect the crisis is something, f certainly, and I'm going to focus on the Iranian perspective, something that Iran does not, does not want to see get out of control. Iran right now simply cannot afford another major foreign policy hot potato on its lap. And Azerbaijan is not uh, an issue that is insignificant because it's not as very significant. But in terms of timing, it's, it's happening at a time when Iran really does have a full plate and wants to put this on the back burner. Now, I can come back to you hopefully in the Q&A later on about what the ultimate Iranian objectives are. And I share some of the views expressed already. The Iranians do have some. Uh, at least certain uh, circles in Tehran do have uh, interest in terms of making inroads into this country because remember, from an Iranian point of view, this is probably one of the most natural countries for the, for the export of the Iranian revolution, Shia uh, country of Azerbaijan. But that's not something that's at the forefront right now. That, that's my reading of the situation. Uh, and I, I will um, very briefly at the end, talk about why Azerbaijan isn't just another foreign policy issue from Tehran's perspective. Look, this is a regime that's been in place for 34 years. And for 34 years, the regime in Tehran has had the issue of, are we the legitimate rulers of this country? I mean, that is, in many ways, if you look at the Iran-US stalemate, that is what is at the center of the debate. They want a recognition from Washington. It's not just about the nuclear issue. Recognize us as the legitimate rulers. So that's something that the regime as a whole has, uh, you know, to, had to wrestle with for all this time. And then you introduce something like the issue of Azerbaijan into the picture. Why is Azerbaijan sensitive? But look, we've heard already, look at the cultural, religious, historic, uh, linguistic, all sorts of proximities that exist. The idea of Azerbaijan becoming a, a, a foreign policy headache for him, much bigger than it is already, isn't just another foreign policy issue. It could have ramifications in Iran. I mean, at a worst case scenario, the strategies in Tehran fear the dismantlement of Iran. They don't look at it just in case of Azerbaijan. They look at Balochistan, Khuzestan, Kurdistan. They look at the sectarian tensions that are happening across the, the, the Middle East, the Shia-Sunni divide and so forth. So there are a whole host of issues that play into it. And I think uh, the interesting part about that is if you look at the debate in Tehran, I would argue while the hardliners, the ones who want to be supporting Islamist entities in, in, in Azerbaijan and elsewhere, are in the driving seat right now. They have the control because they have the ear of the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. But in reality, in terms of numbers, they are a minority. And you know, right now they're playing this high stake game, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the United States on the nuclear issue. But if they fail, if there is a big failure happening on their watch, the question is, can the pragmatic forces come to fore? Now, we heard the presidential elections are coming up. Look at the debate right now in terms of the, the, the elections. You've got really three schools of thought in Tehran. You've got the people around Khamenei, particularly the top uh, tiers around uh, in the IRGC, the Islamic Revolution Guard score. Then you've got the pragmatic forces that are around people like Ayatollah Rafsanjani and the so-called so green reformist movement that is, is a bit of a mishmash, but it's there. And then you've got people around Ahmadinejad. Uh, they're, they're all over the place. They're populist in terms of their foreign policy. But my point is, you've got different schools of thought when it comes to the, the uh, pursuit of foreign policy, and you cannot discount the fact that sometime in the future, maybe after these elections, you can see a, a, a change away from this idea of exporting the revolution to the region. Um, the idea that this 
region as a whole is not ready to accept our revolution, is not prepared for it, it for, for whatever reason doesn't want it. And you can look at what's happening in the Arab world and say that's where the Iranians are getting their lessons from. Look how quickly Hamas and Muslim Brotherhood has been able to uh, turn its back on Iran. The fact that Khalid Mashal packed up and left Syria as quickly as he did after 11 years of being there, the, you know, having the Iranians foot the bill, the fact that Mohammed Morsi in Egypt has been very cold towards the Iranians, these things put, put together could create a whole new strategic uh, shift in Tehran that says exporting of the revolution is not going to happen right now. Why don't we put our national interests first? And I think there are many people, again, if you look, look at and listen to the debate in Tehran, who are saying that, who are openly saying we will do much better in a country like Azerbaijan if we don't go in with the idea of the Vilayat Fari and Shia Islam, but go in with the idea of Persian poetry, food, and things that we can actually sell to these people. Not just in Azerbaijan, across the former Soviet South. These people exist, and they're actually in the majority, but because of the system in Iran, they don't have um, their voices heard. But again, you don't have to go back that far. Go back to 97 to 2005, when somebody within this Iranian regime, uh, President Mohammad Khatami, did implement moderate policies. So I think that's the kind of, uh, you know, in the absence of regime change in Tehran, that's the kind of hope one could have and say, well, you know, maybe the Iranian supreme leader, who right now is the ultimate power, uh, might look around in the region and realize that the old idea of exporting the revolution is not going to happen. Um, and I think, you know, we might be mov moving in that, in that direction. Um, let me stop there, and then I look forward to the Q&A. Okay, thank you. We have about uh, almost 20 minutes uh, left for, uh, for, for Q&A. Uh, so, please, uh, when I call upon you, uh, please provide your uh, name and affiliation, and um, I'll, I will turn to you later. Andranik, I promise you, you will have you will have your have have, have your time. Um, yes, here in the front row. Uh, I'm Peter Humphrey. I'm an Intel analyst. I, it, it's one of the countries. Iran is one of the countries that could conceivably fracture after a major change in administration, and in that scenario. Um, South Azeris might look very fondly upon their brethren to the north. Would the Azeri people welcome a gnosis with South Azerbaijan if Iran were to dis dis dissolve in some way? Uh, I will answer the question. Well, this is, uh, this is not a rare question. Uh, the accounts are different. Some say that 30 million Azeris live there, some say that 15, some say that 40. You can imagine that there may be very different people among them. And nine million people live in Azerbaijan in the north itself. And since, uh, as I said, since the Turkmen Chaipias, the roadmaps were different. Of course, there are people who would welcome that. And there are people also who think that these more than 200 years changed the two parts so much that this is just uh, two parts of the same nation with a very different psychologies and mentalities. When I meet people from the South Azerbaijan, I see that, well, they're more or less similar. I can eat, I can drink, I can go to a party, I can discuss something. But it's a big question if it's a possible to build uh, the same state with those people. We're not talking about just uh, living for a week together. This is a political issue. And the number of people there and in, in modern Azerbaijan is very different. So there are even people who think that it's not so south of the Bajan would join north, but vice versa. So this, this is very different opinion exists on that. Thank you. But also I would like to add some issue that uh, Azerbaijan is in Iran probably in a very difficult situation. No any simple ethnic rights. Uh, Azerbaijani communities, they have no schools, they have no universities, they have not any uh, potential opportunity to grow their culture and language. And uh, I think uh, this is the worst situation. And also uh, culture, common culture, music versus uh, also uh, becoming a serious factor. For example, there were negative reaction of Iranian government to new satellites of Azerbaijan. Because uh, 
Azerbaijani TV, Azerbaijani music, uh, as uh, you know, rock uh, play a very important role for collapse of Soviet Union. <laughs> Culture play a very important role. Culture of northern Azerbaijan created a serious influence to Iran, and also sport. There are uh, some uh, factors that uh, tractor club uh, of Tabriz during the matches of this football club, uh, thousands of people shouting that Azerbaijan is not Iran. And with uh, <clears throat> this type of effort, sport and culture play a very important role keeping ethnic identity of Azerbaijanis in Iran. And uh, uh, also uh, new technologies, internet, uh, TV, uh, space broadcasting of Azerbaijanian culture, uh, cultural program from Turkish channels play a very important role uh, for millions of Azerbaijani, which has not uh, any simple ethnic right. We can compare uh, Armenian community, very small Armenian community, they have their own school, they have their, all their rights, protection of uh, rights in Iran, but no such chances for Jews and Azerbaijanis. It's uh, interesting. Thank you. My name is Niklas Anzinger. I work for the American Enterprise Institute. I have a question for Mr. Vatanka. Um, you briefly mentioned that Iran might adjust its policies vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan in pragmatic ways. Um, you know, with the upcoming elections in Iran in mind, which are taking place in June, um, you know, there are a lot of different factions and camps which compete for uh, power in Iran. Do you see any tendency for the upcoming elections? in the Iranian power structure? Any tendencies where, it's my, where it oh. might go? You know, I wish I could say I, I do, but I, I can tell you foreign policy in the overall scheme of things in the, in the election cycle so far has not been at the top of the list. I mean, right now we're still trying to figure out who's going to put their names forward. We've got another two weeks left before the final candidate list will be there. Um, but the key foreign policy issues relate to the United States, obviously the nuclear program, and these are the so-called red strategic issues that only one person, Ayatollah Khamenei, controls, and he's not up for election, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, nobody's going to dare question the fundamentals. Arguably, you will say foreign policy in Iran is about those issues, and that's exactly what we should have the debate about. But because of the, the system, the fact that Khamenei has very publicly and basically word by word has said, only I will decide the course of relations with the United States. And, you know, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad tried, but he was slapped down. But I really think Khamenei is also sufficiently pragmatic to be able to listen to advice that comes to him from beyond the circles right immediately surrounding him who are hardliners. So even if you look at his own family household, there are people who are married into the Khamenei household who have people like uh, uh, Kamal Kharazi's family, uh, the guy Sadiq Kharazi, who was a former ambassador to France, who runs a very, a very decent website called Iranian Diplomacy, which happens to publish in Farsi and English. Look it up. You see these moderate views. Now, again, there's a lot of self-censorship going on. People have to be careful what they say. They cannot come in and say, you know what, we're totally wrong in terms of this hostility against country A, B, and C. But they are saying we need to change. Uh, but foreign policy, right, right now, the big issue in Iran is who will be approved by the Guardian Council to run for the elections. And people are p playing it very safe. Nobody wants to dare say a word that will get them disqualified. Oh, hello. Um, thank you for um, uh, this very interesting uh, panel and the discussion. Uh, recently, Oh, sorry, I'm Hovane Stikogosian, a visiting scholar from Duke University. Um, I have a question to uh, Alex Votanka, and sorry to abuse your voice if, um, um, uh, with a question, but uh, whenever I'm hearing with this uh, ethnic kinship issue between uh, Azeris living in Azerbaijan and the people living in the north of Iran, I'm reminded of the difference uh, between the epic tales that these two people uh, consider their, uh, their his uh, their, their dispatch their uh, history Namely, in um, Azerbaijan, they uh, consider the book of Dede Korkut, I guess, as the pan-Turkic tale, as their epic uh, story. Whereas the people in north of Iran 
consider the Shahnameh as their epic tale, which is all Iranian or, shall I say, all Persian. Can you comment on this? Because I'm, uh, whenever I'm hearing with this, with this, with these discussions, I'm reminded of this difference, which uh, mm. maybe we can draw parallels between Austrians and, and Germans who speak the same language, but nevertheless, that they are very different nations. You know, uh, thank you for thank that you. question. I, I can't really tell you much about the specifics of that question because you simply don't know enough about it. So I'll uh, sort of, I guess, um, stop there. But in terms of the bigger question about, you know, what. What's the nature of relations between the two people, what nation divided? It's about 200 years ago, actually, I think exactly 200 years ago that, you know, the, 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 the Russians captured what is today uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, so forth, from the Persian Empire. So a lot of, a lot of water under the bridge already. Um, you know, you listen to Azeri in, in Baku versus Tabriz, you either hear Russian or Farsi, depending where you are. You hear that, you, you know, obviously it's had an impact. Um, but I think the peoples are much closer than one perhaps thinks as well. That's my reading. I, I can tell you the last couple of years, to my surprise, because I've always been one who's argued that the notion of greater Azerbaijan really doesn't have much traction among the elite in Baku. They look at the south and they, they see a, a, a project that they cannot manage. I mean, look at the sizes. A country of 8 million taking a country, Azeri's population of 25 perhaps to 30 million. How can you manage that? Uh, but on the, on the Iranian side, also the idea of greater, Azerba uh, greater Azerbaijan has increasingly though in recent years um, started to to take off I, I see the youth I mean I compare um, the older generation with the youth and I see the youth are taking a different turn now this is the question that deserves to be studied is it because of the Azeri uh, kinship that is making them become more assertive in terms of their ethnic identity or is it a, a, a fundamental um, problem with the lack of legitimacy on the part of the regime in Tehran. So it's a governance issue. And I suspect it's got a lot to do with governance, because if you look at the Azeri grievances in Iran, they are pretty much identical to Kurdish or Baluch uh, grievances in that country. Actually, they've come together in a sort of ethnic minority. Political parties have to come together as one entity, United Front, asking for better rights and representations. So I think we shouldn't um, take our eyes away from the question of governance and legitimacy, because I think we find a lot of the answer there in terms of what drives people in places like Urumiya, Tabriz, and Ardabil. But uh, also there is another factor, because Dada Gorgut is a Turkish language, uh, and Shahnameh is Persian. Turkish identity is forbidden in Iran. Uh, that's why uh, they, even in school, they study Shahnameh on Persian, and uh, there is no any information about Deda Gorgut, and it's forbidden uh, to even touch issue of Turkish identity of Azerbaijanis in Iran. That's why there is a, such a difference. But independent Azerbaijan uh, has uh, more chances uh, to learn uh, their own history, their own uh, literature. And, Thank you very much. My name is Fakhreddin Ismailov. I'm from the Embassy of Azerbaijan. Uh, I have a small question for Mr. Asim Zaydeh. He mentioned the, the Armenian community living in Iran. Fortunately, it's become a, a major objective for Armenian community and diaspora organization uh, to try to impede the relation between their host countries and Azerbaijan. Could you please elaborate your views on the impact or influence, if there's any, of Armenian community on bilateral relations between Iran and Azerbaijan? Thank you very much. Uh, uh very small Armenian community in Iran, but it's a unique uh, community which has uh, more rights than any other ethnic groups in Iran. It's an interesting situation that even uh, Armenian community has a right producing alcohol, uh, but uh, there is no any other rights for Christian or Jewish uh, communities uh, in Iran. And of course, uh, very strong uh, and also very business active Armenian community playing a role uh, in a factor, for example, breaking isolation of Iran after the sanction on financial terms, uh, using their links with Armenian banks, uh, Armenian community in Iran uh, working very actively. And of course, uh, Armenian community in Iran uh, uh, creating uh, problems on relationship between Iran and Azerbaijan because uh, it's uh, 
uh, obvious for us that uh, Iran, uh, using the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia for keeping their influence uh, in the region, and uh, right now Iran is the major factor who uh, help with energy, fuel to uh, a regime in Karabakh. I was a witness of that in all Karabakh uh, petrol station there are uh, Iranian tanks. And uh, it's uh, maybe Armenian community run play a role for that. Again, uh, we need a serious support for international community to help to Azerbaijan and Armenia solve this conflict. And maybe in this situation, we will break Iranian influence to the region of South Caucasus. Thank you very much. I'm Andrani Kovanis, an embassy of Armenia. Um, it has not uh, become a surprise for the Armenian diplomats to hear from Azerbaijani speakers all kind of propaganda uh, pieces. Whenever Azerbaijanis have an access to a microphone, we are ready to listen uh, anti-Armenian propaganda, and this was the case today as well. Uh, but today, our Azerbaijani uh, friends went as far as to question Armenia's independence on territorial integrity. Mr. Mamedou specifically referred to Armenia as geographically Azerbaijan territory. So, uh, I think it's obvious that anything said about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, any terms used are also on Azerbaijani propaganda, including the allegations of so-called occupation. Just, I would not enter into the Nagorno-Karabakh issue, it's not the theme of the day, just to mention that the international mediation format, which is the means group, has never, never referred to Nagorno-Karabakh as an occupied territory. And I will pass to... Uh, uh, comment the speakers of the day. Mr. Molazadeh claimed that uh, Iran supported Armenia uh, during the Armenian side during the war in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is another blatant misrepresentation. Um, it's not true. Uh, on the contrary, there were some reports saying that Iran militarily supported Azerbaijan. I don't know whether these comments are, uh, or claims are true or not. But they are coming as high as from the Imam of Ardabil, as high as from the former commander of Iranian National Revolutionary Guard, and uh, from the contemporary media. If one opens the media of 1990s or Washington Post, New York Times, there are a lot of such allegations. Again, I don't know if they are true or not, but there have been reports that Iran supported Azerbaijan during the war in Nagorno-Karabakh, and there have never been any reports of Iran supporting Armenian side. This is blatant misrepresentation. Now let me pass to the uh, issue of Iran-Armenian relations. Yeah, today we have heard a lot from our Azerbaijani friends about Iran relations with, uh, Azer uh, with Armenia. However, I came here today to hear about the uh, relations between Iran and Azerbaijan, as the title of the conference itself says. Uh, but I, uh, I wonder why Azerbaijani friends are so shy to speak about the relations with, between Iran and Azerbaijan. You are sharing the cultural, religious, ethnic, uh, strong kinship with uh, uh, Iran, and it's natural that Iran is cooperating on all those issues with uh, Azerbaijan and vice versa, but you have not touched those issues. I don't know what's the reason. You can mention that uh, uh, Iranian students, for example, I mean, excuse me, Azerbaijani students, for example, um, get their education in uh, Iranian religious seminaries, like in Qum. Annually, about 250 to 300 persons from uh, Azerbaijan get their education there. You can also dwell upon the uh, economic relations. You haven't mentioned any project between Iran and Azerbaijan. But guess what? Iran has huge investments in Azerbaijan. 10% of Shah Deniz is Iranian. 10% of South Caucasus pipeline is Iranian. It's okay if it is within the uh, international sanctions regime. I don't see anything bad in that when countries, neighboring countries cooperate. And Armenia doesn't make any secret about its cooperation with Iran. It's transparent, it's free, because simple reason that countries in 20th century, especially neighboring countries, cooperate with each other. There is no secret about that. And uh, Armenia does everything again in the uh, framework of international obligations, and we are not making secret about that. But I'm surprised to hear the criticism of Armenian uh, media freedom coming from a country which is ranked in the 15 most censored countries in the world. According Where to did the, you hear that According, according to the uh, no, committee, excuse me. committee for... Anybody yeah. told here about the critics of Armenian media? Who, who told here that there is no media freedom in Armenia? Thank you, let me finish. The coming from the country which is ranked 15th 
in, according to the Committee for Protection of Journalists, 15th most censored countries in the world. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned about... Uh, uh, like I speak English, sir. Sorry. I mentioned you not critiques. I mentioned that you should distinguish the Russian sources in Armenia and Armenian sources or English sources. Because in English, Armenian media never writes about the brother relations. But you think we don't read uh, uh, that websites or we don't go to openarmenia.am or something? We don't read Voskanapat? We don't read those crazy analysts that you have? Um, These people don't know Russian. They don't know, don't know that, but we do. Time out. Question. Do you have a question? No. Okay. We do. <laughs> then, you, then please. Sorry, Andronik. This is a. Yeah. You don't. We don't need to hear the, uh, the again the, the official position uh, countered. If you have a question, please. Uh, Mr. Kachin, there are a number of questions. The you, biggest I'd, I'd question. Like, I'd like to hear one. We are literally out of time on this panel. I okay, then sorry. let me let me pass to my question. Thank you for your uh, patience. I would like to ask Mr. Mirza if he reads all the WikiLeaks cables and not only those coming from Armenia but also coming from Azerbaijan. In particular, has he read the cable from coming from Azerbaijan? the embassy, uh, embassy of the United States in Azerbaijan in March 2009, which specifically uh, uses the words sanction besting, and this is the language used by the cabal, not by myself, uh, describing relations between Azerbaijan and Iran. Thank you. I don't comment issues on WikiLeaks. <laughs> uh, Jess, uh, I would like uh, to remind uh, our colleagues from uh, Armenia about the resolution uh, of uh, Security Council of uh, United Nations about the occupied Azerbaijani territory. Also, uh, resolution of European Parliament, Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe about the occupied territory, ethnic cleansing of uh, Azerbaijanis in occupied territory. Because under occupation is not only a uh, mountain part of Karabakh, seven regions of Azerbaijan uh, occupied by uh, Armenian forces and all Azerbaijan is ethnically cleansed from this area. That's why I would like to remind you about that and about uh, economic relations between Azerbaijan and Iran. I just uh, gave an information, uh, a trade between Azerbaijan and Iran, uh, transparent, it's open information, is about 300 million, uh, but the trade between Azerbaijan and Israel, 4 billion. Uh, but, but it's okay. Uh, Azerbaijan would like to continue to have a neighborhood, normal neighborhood policy uh, with Iran. But uh, we have other fact. Uh, in center of Baku, after fatwa of Ayatollah Lankarani was killed a Rafik Tari, a radical secular writer. Uh, Iran tried to organize terror acts in Baku on eve of uh, European uh, <clears throat> song content because this European popular music event is, was a serious threat against a totalitarian Islamic regime. And uh, we mentioning that. Azerbaijan needs a normal relationship with all uh, neighbors, and Azerbaijan now urgently needs a peace with Armenia. We're calling Armenia to peace. We need Armenia as a partner of Azerbaijan and Georgia. We need Armenia as a partner of the uh, Euro-Atlantic community, not a partner of Iran or uh, uh, tool in the hands of uh, Russia for the idea of restoration of Soviet Union in new form. Uh, only Armenia has a Russian troops in our region. And uh, all troops from Georgia and Azerbaijan were moved to Armenia. It's a huge Russian uh, military base. And as uh, Speaker of Russian Parliament says, that Armenia is our outpost, military outpost. Come on, we need Armenia as an independent state. We need Armenia as a partner of NATO country, partner of the United States. And also we need that the Armenian community in the United States will help us to make Armenia as a friend of the United States, not uh, Iran or Russia. That's all. Okay, we're going to have to uh, uh, bring this panel uh, to an end. Let me extend my thanks to Mr. Malazada, Mr. Mirza, and uh, Mr. Patanka for their uh, Excellent uh, con contributions, and for your contributions as well. We will take a. Uh, uh, we will continue with the second panel starting sharply at 10:45, which is in about uh, seven minutes. Okay, thank, thank you. you.